God bless you. Tonight we're going to look at the subject matter of the Mosaic Covenant. We've uh, already seen the Abrahamic Covenant and we've seen the Davidic Covenant. And as John told you in the last session, we uh, took the Davidic Covenant out of order where the Mosaic Covenant comes before the Davidic Covenant. But we did this because we want to connect the Mosaic Covenant with the New, co new Covenant as we progress into the the, um, the Mosaic Covenant is different than the Abrahamic and the Davidic Covenant in this manner, or in a lot of ways, but the, the other two, the Abrahamic Covenant, the Davidic Covenant, they go on into the ages to come. The Mosaic Covenant came to, an, it, it began at Mount Horeb, and then it ended at Calvary. The, the Mosaic Covenant is no longer relevant to those who are followers of Christ. We are under the new covenant. The Mosaic covenant is referred to as the old covenant. So um, if you take your Bibles tonight and turn to Exodus chapter 2, we want to begin by looking at what the purpose of the covenant was. In Exodus chapter 2 is uh, the record when <coughs> Israel is in Egypt, well, actually, so to, be, to get a running start on this, when Israel was, um, J Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Israel had 12 sons. They became, the, you know, they got married. They had a big families and so on. There's 75 of them, and they're living in the land, and there's a drought, and they go into Egypt because one of... Uh, Israel's sons, Joseph, is in Egypt, and he has become very powerful in Egypt. He's the right-hand man of Pharaoh. So uh, all of Israel then goes into Egypt, and they are in the land of Goshen. They're prospering. They're blessed. Pharaoh welcomes them and is, is kind to them. And, uh, of course, Joseph, being the, the vice regent of uh, Pharaoh, he continues to take care of the people, and everything is good. Time moves on. They're in, they're in um, Egypt for hundreds of years. And as the time goes on, of course, Pharaoh dies and the original, the original patriarchs all die. And the, the pharaohs became anxious of the, the size of Israel. They kept on procreating. And now where they were once 75 people, now they're in the, after 200 years or so, they are in the millions and Pharaoh is intimidated by that. He thinks that if they have a revolt, they'll overcome the Egyptians. So they begin to persecute the Israelites, and they become slaves. They made them to be uh, slaves to the Egyptians. It got so bad for the Israelites, and Pharaoh was so uptight or nervous about them continuing to grow, he gave orders that all of the male children that were born were to be put to death right after birth. They gave orders to the midwives. So they're in this horrific slavery situation. They're truly oppressed and uh, they're losing their boy children. And then in Exodus, that's where we are now in Exodus chapter 2, verse 23. It's called Exodus because it's the Exodus from Egypt. They're leaving Egypt. In verse 23, 2.23, now it came about in the course of those days that the king of Egypt died and the sons of Israel sighed because of the bondage. And they cried out and their cry for help <clears throat> because of their bondage rose to God. So God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God saw the sons of Israel and God took notice of them. What had happened with Israel once they went into Egypt, <clears throat> after time went on, Egypt got into Israel. And they started worshiping the gods, the many gods of Egypt. Egypt had a sun god, they had a Nile River god, they had all these different gods. And Israel, who should have been loyal to Yahweh, started worshiping all of these other gods. At best, they thought Yahweh was one of many gods. So that's one of the major reasons why they ended up in the horrific situation that they were in. Now, what we just read is God took notice of them and remembered 
the Abrahamic covenant. He remembered the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And because of that covenant, because God swore, remember God promised, God cut a covenant, and then God swore that he would do what he said he would do. He remembered that covenant, and now he's going to respond and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they uh, go into this covenant relationship, and that's what we want to primarily focus on. Go to chapter 19, please, of Exodus. <clears throat> the covenant, God's promise in this covenant, God promising to do what he was going to do, and then Israel was to do what they were supposed to do. And here is a synopsis of what God said he would do in 19.5. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, you know the storyline. He brought them out of Egypt with the ten plagues. They crossed the Red Sea. They went on the other side of the, you know, the Red Sea. All the Egyptians died. Now we're at this Mount Horeb. It's about, I don't know, it's maybe a month or two into their time. And uh, he's speaking to them. He says, you remember what I did? And I brought you to myself. God said to Israel, I brought you to myself. Now then, if you will, in, will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. This is what God told Moses to speak to Israel. In verse 5 again, my own possession. In the King James, it, it says uh, peculiar treasure. Instead of the words own possession, it says peculiar treasure. If you got the NASB, it says there's a, there's a footnote. It says special treasure. You will be my special treasure. You will be my possession, my peculiar treasure. I'm going to treasure you. I'm going to love you and care for you and provide for you. That's what God promised to do for them. In a very, uh, we're going to look in more detail, but that's the, the essence of what he promised to do. And then he said, you then obey my commands. And that's basically what the covenant was about. As you remember, well, as this goes on, I'll tell you the end before we get to it. Well, as this goes on, Israel is not... Israel is not faithful to keeping the covenant. They don't obey him. They start worshiping other gods again. And ultimately, they break the covenant over and over and over again. However, God keeps the covenant, and it will be, it, it, it's in suspend, in suspended right now, but in the end, when Christ comes back, the covenant will be fulfilled. It was, it was fulfilled in part when they're led into the promised land, but it will be completely fulfilled when Christ returns. Now, John told us that a covenant is a solemn binding agreement between two parties. It's a solemn binding agreement between two parties. Each party promises to perform certain actions. Well, let's look and see what God promises first in Exodus 23. Exodus 23, in verse 20. This, this is extraordinary, what, what God committed himself to do here. Uh, again, in this covenant. Behold, I am going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place which I have prepared. Be on your God before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious towards him. For he will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversary. I'm on your side. If you obey me as a covenant in a, this covenant relationship, I'm going to be your God. I'm going to be your protector. I'm going to take care of you. Verse 23 for my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Pedrasites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. You shall not worship their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their deeds, 
but you shall utterly overthrow them and break their sacred pillars in pieces. But you shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall not be one miscarrying or barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. You're going to have women, when they get pregnant, they're going to deliver the babies. There'll be nobody, and, and nobody will be barren. Everybody will be able to have a baby, and then they, the babies will be delivered. And you will live a long, full life. I will send my terror ahead of you. Verse 27. Thrown, throw into confusion all the people among whom you come, and I will make you... I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Verse 28, I will send hornets ahead of you so that they will drive out the Hivites and the Canaanites and the Hittites before you. And I will drive them out before you. I will not drive them out before you in a single year that the land may become desolate as the beasts of the field become too numerous for you. But I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. This is, he says, I'm taking you into this land. It's occupied by all of these Canaanite people. And here's how we're going to do it. I'm going to be an adversary to your adversary. I'm going to be an enemy to your enemy. I'm going to send hornets in and they'll drive the inhabitants out. This is the way to fight a war. Right? I mean, without spears and bow and arrows and bazookas or whatever. I, I mean, what do you do when you see a hornet? Right? You run, right? Well, he's going to drive, he's going to send in all these hornets. The people are just going to get up and run out. And then Israel's going to move in to their neighborhood, take over their homes, take over their crops, take over their livestock. And he says, I'm not going to do this all at once for the whole place. I'm just going to do it. Little by little. Then when you occupy that and you need more space, I get more hornets, we'll get rid of more people. And you move back in. I mean, it's a perfect situation. And you, you, we know God has the ability to do this. They know God has the ability to do this. They saw the lights, the lice, and the frogs, and, the, and all the other plagues that transpired. So just do what I tell you, and this is what I'm going to do for you. Not a bad deal. Verse 31, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines from the wilderness of the river Euphrates, and I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. The map we saw in our last session is what he promised that he would do for them, uh, of that, that whole area. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in your land because they will make you to sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. I want you to serve me and me alone. I don't want you to serve other gods. So you drive all of them out and you live in a harmonious, loving relationship with me. <clears throat> Again, in your, in your syllabus, it says the promises pertained to physical and material blessings. Land, bread, water, no sickness, no miscarriages no barrenness. The promises were not regarding, though, salvation and righteousness or eternal life. None of the things that God said to him pertain to those subject matters, very important subject matters. It was about physical and material blessings. It wasn't about spiritual blessings, and it wasn't about eternal life. The second major promise of Moses' covenant was that God would provide a sacrifice for man's redemption. This understanding is set forth in the tabernacle service, which was, central, was, which was centered in animal sacrifices. The whole animal sacrifice, we'll see in a minute, was all about a type for what God promised to do for them, which was to forgive their sins, and ultimately, in the end, make it so that they could have the eternal salvation. <clears throat> Israel's responsibility in the covenant, let's look at that. They were to obey his voice. We had already read these verses in Exodus. Let me show you the, this uh, verse in Deuteronomy chapter 4. It's up here on the screen. Know therefore today and take it to your heart that Yahweh, he is what? 
Yahweh, He is God in heaven above and on the earth below. There is none other. And you shall, you shall keep His statutes and His commandments. You shall keep His statutes and His commandments, which I am giving you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may live long on the land which Yahweh your God is giving you for all time. Here's, here's, I'm going to do all these things for you, and what you're supposed to do in the covenant, your part of it is, you obey me. Do what I tell you. It says it again in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the judgments which Yahweh your God has commanded me to teach you, Moses speaking, that you might do them, that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear Yahweh your God to keep, to keep all his statutes and his commandments, to do them and to keep them, which I command you today, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. O Israel, you should listen and be careful. Listen and be careful to do it. Do these things. Listen, be careful to do it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, just as Yahweh, the God of your fathers, has promised you in the land flowing with milk and honey. It's a simple agreement. God said he's going to provide everything that they need, all the, and their part of it is they are to obey and to do what God tells them to do. Now, um, let's look at Exodus 19 and where this covenant began when it got started, the day it got started. <clears throat> In Exodus 19, God had, in the, the verses previous to what we're going to read, God had told the Moses to have the people consecrate themselves, to wash themselves, and present, they're going to present themselves to Yahweh. In verse 16, So it came about on the third day when it was morning, about that there were... Now they're at Mount Horeb. So it came about on the third day when, when it was morning, there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain, and a very loud trumpet sound, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. I don't know about you, but if you... Thunder shakes me. I mean, it, it, it rocks me. I'm not real thrilled with lightning either. You know, when it's big and bright and, and lightning and thunder, and, you know, then there's a cloud over the mountain, and then this trumpet thing. What, you know, you can explain the other stuff, but the trumpet... That's, that's hard, you know, and it gets louder and louder as it goes, as time goes on. So, so in verse 17, And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke. I said Horeb, it's Sinai. Is that the same thing? We don't know. It's called both. It's called both, okay. <laughs> Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb, was in, it was all in smoke because Yahweh descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like a smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked violently. Can you imagine this? You got lightning, you got thunder, you got a trumpet. Now you got fire on top of the mountain and smoke billowing up and if that isn't enough to get your attention, the whole mountain's shaking and they're at the foot of the mountain. Got their attention, right? <laughs> When the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him with thunder. And Yahweh came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. So now, God has got everybody's attention. It's not just Moses, all of Israel. They're surrounding the mountain. All of this is going on. He's got their attention. Then, chapter 20, then God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God. Would you have listened at this point? I mean, well, first of all, there's a voice talking to you from the mountain, okay? I mean, are you going to be listening? Are you going to be humble and meek and willing to receive? I think everybody heard this. It wasn't just Moses. Everybody heard this. 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the Ten Commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. There's one God. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. There is only one God. You will have no other gods before me. That's, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean they should have other gods. It means you will have no other gods in my face. You know, you know, I'm your only God. You shall not make for yourselves an idol of any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. This is what was going on in Egypt. For I, Yahweh your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the children, unto the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands and to those who love me and keep my commandments. The third of the Ten Commandments. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain, for Yahweh will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. The fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Six days you have labored and do all your work, but on the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Yahweh your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your sons or your daughter, your male or your female servants or your cattle or your journeyman who stays with you. For six days the Lord Yahweh made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Now the next commandment, the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. 13, verse 13, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These are the ten Ten Commandments, or verse 17 is the tenth. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. And all the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mounting smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. Then they said to Moses, Speak to, to us yourself, and we will listen. But let not God speak to us, or we will die. I, we really don't want God talking to us. Let him talk to you, and then you talk to us. <laughs> I can't even, I don't know. That's kind of weird, right? This God talking to us is a little bit much for us to handle. I, we, you go ahead and talk to him, and then tell us. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you, in order that the fear of him may remain with you, so that you may not sin. So the people stood at a distance while Moses approached the thick cloud where God was. I just wanted to show you these Ten Commandments here on the board for a particular reason. Number one again, you shall have no other gods. Number two, you shall... Note number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. This is, um, obviously I've shortened it. This is a summary of them. The third one, don't take the name of Yahweh or your God in vain. Fourth, observe the Sabbath. Honor your father and mother. Six, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness. Number ten, you shall not cover your neighbor's house, wife, servant, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. You got it? Number two is what? No idols. Number ten, don't covet any of your neighbor's stuff. Now this is what the Bible says, and this is what's prevalent in most Protestant churches. The Roman Catholic Church has a different Ten Commandments, and I got this from the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, this is their Ten Commandments. You shall not worship, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him alone shall you worship, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Wait a minute. Back here, that was number three. You shall not take the name of Yahweh your God in vain. Number two was, you shall not make for yourself an idol. They left that one out. Then you come down here to number nine. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife. Number ten, you shall not cover covet your neighbor's goods. 
they split the tenth one in two, and they eliminated the second one. Hmm. The people said, hmm. Have you been to a Catholic church? There's idols all over it. And uh, the Catholics have been notorious for idol worship. And um, they changed the Ten Commandments. We have the Bible as our standard for truth and not uh, something else. <laughs> then, um, let's see. Verse 18, we read that, right? Verse 22, And then Yahweh said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen that I have spoken to you from heaven. You shall not make other gods besides me, gods of silver, gods of gold, and you shall not make them make for yourselves. So what did he, he comes out of the Ten Commandments. He recapitulates two of them. He says, you know, you worship me, and you don't make idols. And that's what they left that out. <laughs> that's the only one they went back and repeated. You shall make an altar of earth, and it goes on from there. So, chapter 20, or chapter, we read that. This is what they're told to do. In Deuteronomy, it says, Yahweh heard the voice of your words. Now, Deuteronomy is written in the 40th year of their time in the wilderness, the last month of the 40th year, right before they go into the promised land. It's all, it's a new generation of people. All the older, the people that went into the wilderness died. 40 years have gone by, 40 years, and, you know, they're in the 12th month of the 40th year. And this... So Moses is retelling them the things that took place 40 years earlier when Yahweh spoke to them. Plus he's, in, he's teaching them about the Mosaic Covenant, what they're required to do. And he might, he's added a few extra things, which we're not going to look at tonight. Yahweh heard the voice, now he's telling them, Yahweh heard the voice of your words when you spoke to me. And Yahweh said to me, I have heard the voice of the words of this people which they have spoken to you. They have done well in all that they have spoken. Now, what that it referring to was when they said to Moses, let God talk to you and you talk to us. God says, well, I heard what they said. That sounds like a good plan. That's what we're going to do from now on. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their sons forever. Go say to them, return to your tents, but as for you, stand here by me that I may speak to you all the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which you shall teach to them. So the people went to their tents, Moses stayed with God, and God instructed Moses in great detail the as more aspects of the covenant, the details of it. And you can see that in chapters 20 through 23. Then in chapter 24, please turn to that. Moses receives this information from God. He comes back to the people. Now that he has all this information, he comes back to the people. He congregates everybody. He tells them what God said to him. That's, that was the agreement, right? God's going to talk to you, and then you're going to talk to us. Well, that's what he does. And then in, in chapter 24, verse 3, Then Moses came and recounted to the people all the words that Yahweh of Yahweh, and all the ordinances, and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words which Yahweh has spoken, what? We will do. We're going to keep this covenant. We're going to keep our part. He's going to do all the things that he said he's going to do. We will do what we're supposed to do. Moses wrote down all the words of Yahweh, and he rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain which with the 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent the young men, the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrifices, sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood that came from the animal. He took half of the blood and put it in the basins, and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. 
Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yahweh has spoken, we will what? Do. We will be what? Obedient. And Moses took the blood and he sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which Yahweh has made with you in accordance with all these words. He in, they, he in, this was the blood covenant. They, they, they entered into this covenant. They agreed to do what was expected of them. And then it's ratified with blood. It's the blood covenant. <clears throat> so, one more time, just to reiterate what I've said thus far. There are two parties involved in the covenant, God and Israel. Moses was the mediator. You understand that he was the mediator because they didn't want God to talk directly to them. They wanted God to talk to Moses and then Moses to talk to them. So Moses became the mediator of the covenant. Now, I don't think it was called the Mosaic Covenant. We call it the Mosaic Covenant. I don't think Moses named it after himself. It was the, the covenant. And when you get to the New Testament, they call it the Old Covenant because we have the New Covenant. So they didn't call it the Old Covenant either. They must have just called it the Covenant, right? <laughs> so these are names that were attributed to it later. So the, Moses is the mediator. The law given at Horeb, or Mount Sinai, where, were the commandments they were to obey. God promised, now it's not only the Ten Commandments, it was all the other stuff that Moses read to them. God promised material blessings, and the whole thing was ratified by blood. It was a blood covenant. In Exodus 24, Moses goes back up to the mountain, and God gives Moses the blueprint for the tabernacle and the Levitical service. In Exodus 32, please turn to that. Moses is on top of the mountain. He's fellowshipping with God. Later on when he comes down off, the times that he, he's alone with God, he comes back into, the, into the, uh, the camp where Israel is. He's so blessed, the glory of the Lord is so bright on his face, they insist that he puts a veil over his face because he's freaking them out with the brightness of God that's radiating from him. Moses had, can you imagine the extraordinary time Moses had? He's on top of the mountain 40 days, 40 nights. God's communicating with him. He's giving him all the information about how to worship Yahweh. He gives him the information, the specific information about the priests, about the Levites, about the sacrifices, about the tabernacle. He tells them all that they need to know in order to worship Yahweh the right way. While this is going on, chapter 32, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who we will go before. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know what, what has become of him. Well, what had become of him is what you asked him to do to receive from Yahweh what you wanted to know. So now they want another God. It's mind-boggling, to say the least. So Aaron, I don't know what he's thinking, but he, he molds the gold, he gets all the gold from all the people, takes the earrings, the jewelry, molds it, you know, melts it down and builds this golden calf. And then the children of Israel start dancing in front of this golden calf naked and carrying on and yahooing and Worshipping the golden calf. Now verse 5, And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Yahweh. And the next day they rose early. and This is the exact thing he told them not to do. This is the exact things the Catholics left out of the Ten Commandments. Don't make idols. This is the thing he repeated when he told them the Ten Commandments. And mind you, the lightning is still there, the thunder is there, the trumpets are going, the mountains are moving. I mean, how, how could you miss this? Well, I'm pretty slow of learning myself, but... <laughs> now, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar. Tomorrow, Verse 6, And the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down at once for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Uh, God's 
blaming Moses. He's saying, your people who you brought up. <laughs> As if it was Moses' idea. I mean, you have to read Exodus. I mean, God had to talk Moses into this, right? I mean, Moses did not want to do this. <laughs> your people, Mo. Then they have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molded calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now, I, I, let me pause for a minute. As insane as this may sound, is it any more insane that one... How many... What is it, Sean? One billion... Catholics, one billion people on the earth today worship with idols. And you don't see it as much here. Go to South America. Go to, go to these, uh, to, in Africa, where idols are very, you go to, go to Colombia. You go to Bogota. And on Bogota, on the very top mountain, there's a big Jesus. On the other side, there's a big cross. They're idols. He didn't want anybody to, he didn't want any image of him. He never let them see him. He didn't want any image of him. He didn't want them to worship idols. They wanted him, he wanted them to worship him. Not an image of him. You get it? This is your God, or is it, that verse, verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. I'm going to start over with you, Moses. Moses is no spring chicken here. I mean, he's already, what, he's 80 at this point. Then Moses ent entreated Yahweh, his God, and said, O oh, Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people? whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With an evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them at the face of the earth. Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by yourself and said, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens. In all this land which I have spoken, I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. He says to Moses had a, a special relationship with Yahweh. There's no doubt about it. But he says, Yahweh, you do remember that covenant that you cut with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You remember? You promised, you cut a covenant, and you swore. You can't kill these people. These are the descendants of Abraham. <laughs> I'll probably forget this later on, but I want, to, I want to say it now, and that is that Moses is interceding for the people, and he is a type for Jesus who intercedes for us because we're just as stupid at times. We'll talk about that some other time, <laughs> our stupidity. So Yahweh changed his mind about the harm which he had said he would do to his people. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 9. <clears throat> this, this verses that we just read are one of the many reasons why I believe that uh, God doesn't know everything that's going to happen before it happens. If God changes his mind, then then he was moving in a certain direction. He would have known that it doesn't make any sense. These words would be meaningless because it says that God was going to do this, and then Moses talked to him, and then he changed his mind. So how could someone who already know what was going to happen before it happened? It's, it's, it's obvious that he's very upset. If he already knew what was going to happen, why would he be so upset? You know, it doesn't, it doesn't fit. So um, I know that, that that's a common belief that people have that he knows everything, but... He knows many things about the future, that's for sure. So they spent the 40 years in the wilderness, and then Deut Deuteronomy, there's a new generation. Um, 
Did I tell you to turn to someplace? Deuteronomy 5, 9, huh? Well, I don't know why I did that. I have that written in my Bible, and it's from a different teaching. <laughs> so don't do that. <clears throat> in your notes, it says, God was faithful to fulfill the covenant. The book of Joshua records God's fulfillment of giving Israel the promised land, even in spite of all this nonsense. God fulfilled the promise of redemption and forgiveness when Christ died on Calvary. And that's when the Mosaic Covenant ended. When Christ died on the cross, the Mosaic Covenant ended. A new covenant began. The new covenant was ratified with the blood of Jesus, just like the old covenant was ratified with the Bullock's blood. This the new covenant, and we'll look at that next week. Now, I'd like for you to go to Galatians chapter uh, 3. Galatians chapter 3. You want to take a break now? Oh, you got five more minutes in you. Galatians chapter 3, no response. Five minutes, okay. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, that is Christ. We, look at, we looked at this in a previous session. What I am saying, to you, saying is this, the law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promises. Let me, say, let me explain that verse. You have God made a covenant with Abraham 430 years before Moses and the Mosaic covenant. What had happened at the time that Paul is writing as the centuries went on, Israel started to think that it was in fulfilling the Mosaic Covenant that they could receive eternal life and righteousness and redemption. That was never the intention of the Mosaic Law. It says the law in verse 17, and the law, sometimes when you read the word the law, it's talking about the whole Mosaic Covenant. Sometimes it's talking about a portion of it. You have to determine it from the context. The law and the Mosaic Covenant are all, all, often the same. It's the law that's within the Mosaic Covenant. The things that <clears throat> Moses was told by God and then Moses told to the people. So, um, so that's what we're dealing with here in Galatians. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came all these years later, 430 years does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. The Mosaic Covenant has absolutely no influence on the covenant that God made with Abraham. Quite contrary, it was the, the, the covenant that God made with Abraham is the reason that God saved Israel to begin with. It wasn't the other way around. There, the, the Mosaic Covenant didn't change any of the Abrahamic covenant. Verse 18, For if the inheritance is based on the law on the Mosaic Covenant is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. What they were saying was, if we carry out the Mosaic Law, then we will get what God promised to Abraham. And, and that's, that's not true. That's what we're, we're refuting here. Why, why then the law? Why, was the, why do we have the law? Why did we get the Mosaic Law? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels... By the agency of a mediator, until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. The mediator was Moses. The angel, the, it says Yahweh spoke to him, but it was an angel that spoke to Moses and then Moses to the people. He was the mediator. Until Jesus came. He was the mediator until Jesus came. Now, a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if the law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on the law. If, you, if the law could have accomplished what Jesus did on the cross, then Jesus wouldn't have gone on the cross. If Jesus didn't have to die, if it could have been done with the Mosaic law, 
then it, that's not the purpose of the law. That's not what the law was about. So what was it about? But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Here. This is the Abrahamic covenant. This is Jesus. The Mosaic law came here 430 years after Abraham. 430 years in between. In between Moses and Jesus is like 1,200 years. The Mosaic law didn't nullify what the promises were made here. These promises relate to Christ, is what we just read. These promises are about Christ and what Christ would accomplish for us. Not these promises. So what was this about? This was about, the Mosaic law was about keeping Israel alive until Christ came. Keeping, it kept them shut in. It says, what was the word? Um, uh, custody. You see the word, verse 20, 23? And before faith came, before Christ came, we were kept in custody under the law. The law gave them parameters. It gave them guidelines. It told them how to live the right way. Even though they would wander, they had a standard. It kept them so that we wouldn't have what we had in Genesis chapter 6 again. A total annihilation of humanity. This is the thing that kept them in custody. As a matter of fact, the Greek word is the word to guard them until Christ. Under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. The law was our tutor, our teacher. And we can't talk about that whole thing there until we have some coffee or refreshments. <laughs> <laughs>